Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to The Future of Energy, a new monthly webinar series presented by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and the Institute for Science and Policy. I'm Trent Noss, Managing Editor at the Institute, and we're thrilled to have you joining us today from all over the state and maybe even from outside of Colorado. In this premiere episode, we're talking electric vehicles with two expert panelists whom I'll introduce in just a moment. The number of consumer EV options has expanded tremendously in recent years. Uh, we've all seen them around town. Some of us might even own one. And we've also seen advances in public transportation electrification, such as all electric buses that can be integrated into existing fleets. Uh, battery technology has come a long way. Charging infrastructure, we'll get into that as well today. And Colorado has identified transportation electrification as a key component to hitting its greenhouse gas reduction targets by 2050 and has laid out an ambitious electric vehicle plan to that end. But while EVs feel like they're gaining some momentum, they haven't really conquered the US market yet. And there are concerns that remain about cost, accessibility, range, life cycle, and uh, we'll get into that as well. Lots of moving pieces, consumer demand, policy, technology, economic impacts, and now, of course, COVID-19 as well. Uh, before we get started, just a couple housekeeping items. The Institute has a ton of great programming happening in October from our bi-weekly COVID-19 series on Monday mornings with the Colorado School of Public Health to our ongoing weekly series about potential wolf reintroduction in Colorado in partnership with the Warner College of Natural Resources at Colorado State University. So the best way to keep up with all that is to sign up for our newsletter. We'll put that link in the chat, uh, or you can find us on social. We're on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Just search Institute for Science and Policy. You can also find us on the web at institute.dmns.org. This presentation today is intended to be interactive. So we want you to send in your questions. We've already had a ton of great, uh, great messages coming in through the chat. So please do keep it up. We're going to hear some presentations from our panelists and then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. And while we may not get to everything, we will uh, try to address as much as we can in the time. So without further ado, let me introduce today's guests. We're delighted to be joined by Michael King. He's the Assistant Director of Electrification and Energy for the Colorado Department of Transportation. He specializes in program and policy development for vehicle electrification alternative fuels, and other emerging transportation technologies. Some of his current focus includes the expansion of statewide DC fast charging networks, the integration of zero emission vehicles into transit agency fleets, and exploring the potential of hydrogen fuel cells for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, Mike, welcome. Thank you, Trent. Uh, very happy to be here. Interested to uh, already starting to read some of the great comments and questions and looking forward to the conversation. Terrific. And we're also joined by Dr. Jason Quinn. He's an Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Director of the Sustainability Research Lab at Colorado State University, where he also earned his PhD. His research focuses on assessment and optimization of emerging technologies as diverse as microalgae biofuels, small modular nuclear systems, uh, grid storage, and of course, electrified transportation. So uh, Jason, thanks for joining us. Yep, it's great to be here. Terrific. And Jason's gonna kick us off with a look at the R&D landscape around EVs and some of the latest applied research. So uh, Jason, take it away. Yep, if you can just confirm that's coming through the way it should. Awesome. So again, I'm really excited to be here and thank you all for kind of taking the time to, to hear one perspective, and I, I would kind of put an asterisk on that. Remember what you paid for, the, you know, for this perspective, kind of as we go forward. So, the future of transportation. Um, I see this not necessarily as a statement, but more of a question, and that's kind of where the research that I'm doing is fitting in. Uh, my email address is here on this first slide. It's on all the other uh, slides. So, as, as if we don't get to questions, feel free to kind of email later in the week. We can kind of go through some of those things. Here's the most important slide of the entire of the entire presentation. It takes great people to do great work. And so presented here are two very talented uh, PhD candidates, two full-time researchers, and then two colleagues in systems engineering that I'm directly working with on this. 
Um, a variety of institutions and national labs are a part of this. And then also super important is the funding that we're getting to do all this work, specifically from the Department of Energy and the National Science Foundation. On the National Science Foundation side of things, I'm a part of a uh, NSF Engineering Research Center that was just launched um, called Aspire. And we're answering this question that I kind of posed on that first slide. And it's taking a, you know, a, a major village, if you will, to answer that question. A variety of, of academic partners, huge support from industry, and then national labs as well, even an international component. And so I encourage you to kind of check out what's going on specifically over there on this topic. Our challenge as this engineering research center is to understand what the future looks like in electrification. So with that, I'll kind of dive in. And this is the interactive portion, right? So if we were all together, all 200 of us, we'd have this huge auditorium and I would ask, raise your hand if your primary mode of transportation is a horse and buggy. And so visually, I think we can all imagine there aren't a lot of hands up right now um, in, in our auditorium, our, our, our pretend auditorium as we look around. And this is just an image from Colorado State. I like to think that everybody's kind of carpooling to work is what I think they're doing, right? Um, and so that leads me to my next question. How many people, and this is a unique audience, right? Because I think there's a lot of adopters here. You know, their primary mode of transportation is an ICE or internal combustion engine vehicle, right? And so... We can imagine there's you know, probably more than half the room have their hands up. And if this was just a general audience, the majority of the hands would be up, right? Um, and then that transitions to the next part is, well, whose primary mode of transportation is an electric vehicle? And as, as Mike alluded to in a lot of the chat, there's a lot of adopters in this room. So there are quite a few hands up, probably a lot more than five years ago, right? We can kind of think about that. And so I guess my point behind this interaction is that We've had a change. There's been this change from horse and buggy to IC engine, and I see a huge change coming that is electrified transportation. And how are we going to adapt to that? We adapted once before. So we have a modern era of roads. That didn't happen until 1956. President Eisenhower signed a, a Federal Aid Highway Act, and it authorized the construction of 40,000 miles of road, the largest public works ever taken on in this country. And it costs a lot of dollars, $500 billion in today's dollars. And so we're at a new crossroads, if you will, in terms of we've been here before, and this was enacted because there was this huge transition from horses to vehicles to internal combustion. And now we're transitioning it again, or it's on the horizon. And what does that delta look like? What does that change look like? Where are we going? What is it, you know, where are the, where's the investment gonna happen? And so I think the unique thing is, is that the electric car is here. You know, it, it's 2008 when the Tesla Roadster was introduced and it really represented, and we can argue about this if we want to, but the first, you know, highway ready electric vehicle. And, you know, the model of the Tesla is similar to a lot of the other OEMs and all of the OEMs, if they don't already have them or producing them. Um, you know, I saw a e-tron, the Audi all electric vehicle out on the road just the other day. And I, I think a lot of you here will attest, like if you go for a drive, sometimes it's as easy as looking in the vehicle you are to see an electric vehicle, but typically you're gonna see a Tesla or a Nissan Leaf or something like that out there. And that, you know, this they're, they're coming and they're here and, and how are we gonna adapt and, and what's that look like? The current model is that we're maintaining the standard vehicle model. We've got a 300 mile range on this vehicle and that's, that's what's gonna make this, you know, make this work. And so the challenges I'm looking into are specific. Range anxiety represents an adoption challenge for electric vehicles. Charging locations, charging time, and then most importantly, cost. And these really represent a lot of charge change challenges to the electrified vehicle fleet adoption. And so what is it that we're doing at the university to kind of look into this? Well, first of all, there are solutions that already exist. And so on the left-hand side here is the Tesla model, right? We have super high power charging and there's all these locations across the US. And this is great if you own a Tesla. If you don't own a Tesla, it's tough to pull up and charge at these stations, next to impossible. Uh, there's some websites that show you how to do it, but again, that's not the right mode, right? That being said, I live in Fort Collins. There's a lot of charging infrastructure in Fort Collins. So the charging infra in infrastructure exists, um, but it's this kind of gas station type model. And is that actually right? Is that the right way to do things? Well, there's other technologies that are illustrated here. Overhead catenary cables in the top. This is not new, right? The, the trolleys of a long, long time ago, this is the technology they used, right? It works. There's some challenges. 
the one in the bottom is almost like the, the the monorail or the light rail kind of model, right? You've got the, or not light rail, but the um, DIA uh, train system. There's a conductive bar that you attach to. And so while these all are unique solutions, I've got one to kind of um, wet your whistle with, if you will. And, and, and that's my vision for the future of electrified transportation, something I think is interesting. And here it is. So I'll let you take a minute and you can kind of look at this. And I guess what I'm hoping is that you don't see any difference from what you currently drive now. And I think that's a key to technology adoption is that it's seamless. And what's going on here is wireless power in motion transfer. And so I'll illustrate that just briefly. Some of you might have seen this. This is my phone and this is a charger. And when I put it on here, it lights up blue because it's wirelessly charging. And so what's going on in this picture is almost the same thing, except for we're just driving at 70 miles an hour as we go across this. And pictorially, this is what it looks like. You've got embedded pads in the roadway and then you've got pads on a vehicle and you're having this handshake and then exchange of power as you drive down the road. And this is a really unique technology um, because it addresses a lot of these concerns. You don't no longer need that um, energy storage, that 300 miles range of storage on board. You can have a much smaller on board energy storage because the energy is in the grid and it's being constantly delivered to the vehicle as it drives on these roadways. Out there, no doubt, but interesting, I think. Um, and so the work we're doing to kind of dive into the research is that we're looking at the optimization of systems considering sustainability. So there's some big words in there. Sustainability is where I'll start. Our focus here is looking at economic viability and then environmental impact through life cycle assessment. Optimization of systems, this is, this is the exciting part. When you look at the transportation sector, there are so many systems. There's, especially when you talk about electrification, there's the grid, there's the user's vehicles, there's the infrastructure that supports that. All of those things come together. And what does that optimization look like? And so how are we doing that? Well, this is just kind of to illustrate some of the things we're working on and some of the core components that come into the modeling work we're doing. I'm a mechanical engineer. So like when I look at these two pieces, I want to know how do they work, right? And then I take them apart and then I usually don't get them back together and work quite perfect. But And so we're using vehicle models, right? And understanding on a you know second by second basis what that energy consumption looks like. So on the left-hand side, this is the I-710 corridor in Los Angeles, and we're looking at the energy consumption as a function of time and then position on the roadway. And that's a critical component to understand what those grid demands are going to be, for example. On the right-hand side, we're looking at infrastructure deployment across the entire United States for electrified transportation, electrified roadways, if you will. What does that look like? How does that roll out? What are those costs? And so the main intent behind these two kind of images are to convince you that we're doing pretty good work and it's complicated, right? And we're gonna pull all this stuff together to get these kind of answers. And so I'm gonna give you the answers with, the, with hopefully I've convinced you that the foundation is at, at least detailed um, and we're trying to cover all our bases. And so when we look at the economics, what's pictured on the left-hand side here would be the journal article or the, you know, the very technical presentation of what the answer is. And on the right, I've kind of summarized it into very high level. What we're looking at here is ICE, or internal combustion engines, compared to electrified vehicles in terms of the cost of ownership. And that ownership breaks down into a cost per mile. On the left, we break it out between standard, you know, light duty vehicles and then uh, heavy duty truck, uh, basically. What we see here is there's a significant savings associated with operating these electric vehicles. And there's a lot of assumptions that go into this. Um, enough for a 12 minute talk all in and of itself. Another focus, is on the environmental side. So again, on the left-hand side, this is the answer in terms of ICE in purple and then electric vehicles in green, and then you know broken down here, just looking at the global warming potential. Huge savings associated with the environmental impact and expected to improve based on you know, renewable energy, further penetration of renewable energy onto the grid. So pulling all this stuff together, these are kind of the answers, right? And so again, these are complicated and hard to digest. And here's the core message. There's three different adoption scenarios associated with this. And, and there's a lot of costing going into this. And there's, and there's repay of the infrastructure. And on the left-hand side of the economics, there's opportunity to make this work um, on, on timescales that are less than the life of the technology being deployed. 
And on the right is the environmental impact. Obviously, depending on the um, adoption scenario, the emissions dramatically can be changed and altered. And again, this is kind of out of a journal article, just kind of highlighting some of the very, very detailed results we're doing. So where are we at? We made a change once before, and it cost a lot of money. Our estimate for what I've talked about here is about twice that. So it's expensive, but it's not outside the realm of what we've invested once before. And so in conclusion, we're at a crossroads, okay? And we're making the transition in the same way that we made the transition from horses to horsepower. Exactly what that looks like, I'm not really sure, but I'm really excited about the answers we're getting and understanding where we're going. And so I'm hoping someday I'll be in an auditorium and I'll gonna ask, who uses in-motion wireless power transfer as a part of their electric vehicle in everyday life? And I would love to see a bunch of hands rise up because I think that would be super cool. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and thanks so much for your time. Great, thanks so much, Jason. Uh, that's, be, I bet a lot of questions to get into in Q&A. Uh, and first we're gonna hear from Mike about some of the things that are happening right here in Colorado. All right, let me just share my screen here. Are you seeing that? All right, thank you. So yeah, Jason, that was a that was a great setup. You've you've made my job easier because I think you've answered a lot of the questions about sort of the the basic challenges and the transition that we're undergoing here um, as as a world as a market. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what are some of the specific things that the state of Colorado is doing to uh, support this transition and to hopefully accelerate this transition. So it, the first thing to, to point out is that, you know, one of the major reasons for this, as Jason alluded to, is the, the greenhouse gas uh, reduction ability of electric vehicles. Um, and Colorado has some really ambitious GHG reduction targets that were put into statute by uh, House Bill 1261 back in 2019. Uh, you can see them there. We've got a 26% decrease by 2025, 50% decrease by 2030, and a 90% decrease by 2050. So this is really challenging to do. This is across the entire state economy, not just transportation. But transportation is the largest contributor of GHG in the state at this point in time. So it's really important that we get this element right. Um, currently, we're working on a greenhouse gas pollution reduction roadmap. I would encourage anyone that's interested in this topic to look into that because that project is still underway. It's a statewide assessment of all the opportunities to reduce GHG across multiple sectors from transportation to buildings to agriculture. And there's going to be some public input opportunities on that coming up in the next month. So why electric vehicles? Well, as I alluded to, they have the potential to, to significantly reduce the GHG impacts of our transportation system. So they have no tailpipe emissions. Uh, the electricity that powers them may have GHG implications, but that uh, the electrical grid is getting cleaner year by year with more renewables. So over time, these vehicles actually become cleaner to drive, which is the opposite of an internal combustion engine vehicle. There's also cheaper maintenance and operations. There's fewer moving parts. So as the EV owners in the audience know, there's not really as much service or maintenance that you need to put into the vehicle. And they, you know, all the indications that we have are that they last a really long time without putting a lot of additional funding into them. And then finally, CDOT believes in giving people traveler choice. So whether that's riding transit, walking, biking, uh, taking an Uber or Lyft or other service, or having an electric vehicle versus an internal combustion engine vehicle, that's part of our mission as an organization. So it's important to note that there are different types of zero emission vehicles. We sometimes use the term electric vehicle, zero emission vehicle interchangeably, but it's important to note that they run the gamut. You know, there's a lot of variety out there and each, each type of vehicle has different needs in terms of infrastructure and what they're good for. So battery electric vehicles, if you think of a Tesla, uh, all the power comes from an external charge. A plug-in hybrid electric vehicle has the ability to charge, but it also has an internal combustion engine that can extend the range and might alleviate some of the anxiety that new EV owners might feel about being able to charge when they need to. Hydrogen fuel cell EVs, uh, there's not a lot of these in Colorado yet. Um, there's more you see in, in, in California, Japan, and Germany. These are EVs, but they're powered by hydrogen gas. Uh, they produce electricity on board the vehicle and produce only water vapor. 
uh, hybrid electric vehicles are like your classic Prius. So it's always using the gas engine, but it's getting extra efficiencies and benefits from the, the onboard battery and, and systems like regenerative braking. Uh, these are not typically classified as zero emission vehicles uh, in Colorado because they are always using a gasoline engine. So they have benefits, but they're not classically what we consider a ZEV. And then there are other options, some things that are more in the heavy duty and medium duty space like renewable natural gas. That's compressed natural gas that's generated from wastewater treatment plants or other sources that would normally just go into the atmosphere, can be repurposed, used for transportation, but they still end up producing emissions at the end. They just are, are used for a transportation purpose in between. So in terms of the EV market in Colorado, uh, we currently have about 30,000 registered vehicles in the state. You can see the breakdown here between battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. And probably to no one's surprise, there is a concentration around the Denver, Boulder, uh, Jefferson County area up in Fort Collins as well. But we're seeing this, this really uh, increase across the state as the infrastructure becomes more available, the vehicles become more available, and people that live in more rural areas gain confidence that these vehicles can meet their needs. Here's a breakdown of the, the, um, the makes and models that are, um, that are currently registered in the state of Colorado. I would encourage you, anyone that's interested in more of this information, if you see the link at the bottom of this slide and we'll share the slides afterwards, uh, this, this dashboard on the Colorado Energy Office site, you can break this down by uh, specific uh, brands and models. You can look by zip code, you can look by county. So you can really delve into the data and it's updated monthly so you can get a sense of what's going on in the state. I put some pictures at the bottom here as well, because one of the interesting things that's happening on the top there, you see you know, a handful of the major uh, manufacturers that currently make EVs available, but we're starting to see a whole bunch of new models coming to market in the next couple of years, from that Rivian pickup truck to the electric Harley Davidson to the beloved Subaru uh, plug-in hybrid that I think a lot of Coloradans would buy if it became available in the state. You can see some of our EV sales targets. Uh, this was a, a study that was done several years ago, and these were different scenarios for how many EVs we felt were, were feasible to be on the roads in the state in the next 10 years. You can see on the high end of that, we're over a million by 2030. On the lower end, we're under 750,000. But again, comparing that to the current number of 30,000, in any case, that's a, that's a really big uh, increase. The Colorado EV plan, which was first written in 2018 but updated last year, has an official target of 940,000 EVs on the road by 2030. Uh, we want to accelerate that transition to get those air quality benefits and also to get more models availability in the state of Colorado because Coloradans have specific needs when it comes to vehicles. And the bigger player we are as a state, the more likely we are to get those newest and most diverse models available for Coloradans to purchase. Um, some parts of this electric vehicle plan that we're working on, we have a clean trucking strategy that, that's in progress right now where we're working with the industries and the communities most affected by the air quality issues related to medium and heavy duty freight and delivery vehicles to, to accelerate their transition, give them the tools they need to start converting some of those, uh, for instance, FedEx, UPS, Amazon delivery vehicles, but also eventually the long range uh, you know, 18-wheeler semi-trailer trucks to zero emission options. Um, we're also working with our transit fleets in the state of Colorado to get a thousand transit uh, zero emission vehicles on the road by 2030. Uh, RTD is a leader right now in the country with 36 of those battery electric buses on the 16th Street Mall, but a number of agencies up and down the I-70 and I-25 corridors are getting into that transition and we hope to, to accelerate that and give them the support that they need. Also looking into a number of other potential future items like hydrogen fuel cells, uh, doing a study of how we ensure that EV equity is maintained. So uh, Jason mentioned the 1956 Highway Act. That was a lot of infrastructure, a lot of investment in the country, but it also destroyed a lot of inner city communities uh, in the process. And so how do, we, how do we build for the future without uh, disproportionately impacting more, some communities more than others and making sure that everybody shares the benefits of this transition? And then also working with uh, auto dealers, technical schools, and others to make sure that the workforce is prepared uh, to maintain these vehicles, to sell these vehicles, and to adopt these vehicles. 
So there's, there's a couple pieces of this campaign, um, you know, that are important. First of all, you, you have to have the vehicles available and you have to have them affordable for consumers. So Colorado has a $4,000 tax credit available. Um, it's one of the highest in the country, but it does ratchet down over time as the price of the EVs gets to parity with ICEVs. So those of you who already have an EV probably know this, but those of you who don't, take a look at those tax incentives to, to maximize your, your value in the next couple of years. There's also federal tax incentives that can be combined with the state ones, although that's a little more complex on the federal side. Uh, there are many electric utilities that offer additional incentives or programs. So to talk to your electrical utility, tell them that you're interested in EVs and they may have programs to help you. Group buy opportunities are another way, um, you know, if a community can organize one of these and purchase a larger number of vehicles at once, the dealership can offer special rates. And so if you look at this link for the Recharge Colorado coaches, they can help you navigate all the incentives that are out there. Um, increasing vehicle availability. The state of Colorado adopted a zero emission vehicle standard in 2019, which will require the automakers to make a, a larger proportion of uh, EV models and makes available in the state in coming years. Uh, we're currently assessing a similar action that was taken by the state of California, but that would apply to trucks. So by making these regulatory changes, we can, we can nudge the, the automakers into making more vehicles available to the public who then have the option to purchase them. These regulations are applied to manufacturers, not consumers. So nobody is forced to buy an EV, but the manufacturers are made to bring more of those to our markets so that they're available when people do want them. Colorado, I mentioned the Colorado clean trucking strategy, trying to get older vehicles off the road, provide incentives for cleaner trucks, building partnerships with national fleets. Um, and, and that's another effort that I would encourage you to look into and get involved with if you're interested. I also talked about some of the grant funding for uh, transit vehicles. So, so far we've awarded $16 million to seven transit agencies to purchase 29 new battery electric buses. Um, and we're gonna continue distributing those funds, many of which came from the Volkswagen settlement that you may have heard about in the news uh, where Volkswagen was cheating some emission standards and had to pay a settlement to the 50 states. Um, we are investing those funds in clean transit and clean trucks and EV charging infrastructure. Another ongoing program, I saw someone mention in the chat that they were looking at EV charging for their building. I would encourage you to look for at the Charge Ahead Colorado grants. These have funded over a thousand EV chargers across the state. Um, they have level two and DC fast charging availability and the folks that work at the Regional Air Quality Council and the Colorado Energy Office can really walk you through the project to understand what your options are and what makes sense for you. We've also awarded a $10.3 million grant to ChargePoint, a national charging company, to build 33 DC fast charging sites across the state of Colorado. We're trying to build a backbone of fast charging so that people in any part of the state feel comfortable traveling those longer distances. We've already opened three of those stations. The photo on the right here is the location at the Dinosaur Welcome Center up in the far Northwest of Colorado. And the rest of those will be opening between now and summer of 2021. This map shows the locations of those 33 are the red dots. The green squares are the ones that are already open, either publicly uh, funded or privately funded. And these, are, these red dots are gonna be turning green over the coming months. So we're really excited that that's going to be an option to travel to every part of the state. Also collaborating with our neighboring states in what we call the Rev West Partnership. So this is a group of eight states making sure that we're coordinating our investments and our policies so that it's not just possible to travel anywhere in Colorado, but anywhere in the Mountain West. And the politics and the funding levels and the geography of these states are radically different in some ways, but we're all on the same page about making sure that this system works effectively for our citizens. I mentioned the Volkswagen settlement, $68.7 million that came to Colorado. Here's how we're investing it in buses, trucks, ZEV charging equipment and some other project types. Um, that's an ongoing effort, but 68.7 million compared to, to what Jason talked about, it's really a drop in the bucket. So we're always looking, what is the next source of funding? How do we keep maintaining this progress once the Volkswagen funds are exhausted? Uh, finally, we're looking at EV education and awareness, understanding the market. Uh, we recently did a study of, of Colorado EV education and awareness attitudes by consumers across the state. 
We found there's low awareness of existing purchase incentives. There's some confusion about charging options and locations that we can correct. But nearly one third of respondents in the state are open to purchasing an EV within the next three years. So that's a tremendous opportunity if we can take advantage of it. Finally, CDOT trying to walk the walk as well. We have 83 natural gas vehicles in our fleet, 29 plug-in hybrids, 12 battery electrics, and 140 hybrid electric vehicles. So this is 30% of our light duty fleet. And once the, the, our current orders are delivered, it'll be 35%. This is important because we wanna show that we are, we are um, you know, meeting our own commitments and, and trying to be part of the solution, but also because it helps us identify the barriers that we have, have faced. Overcoming those challenges helps us design better programs for other folks to follow suit. So I went a little long there. I apologize for that, but I wanted to, uh, give you kind of a high level overview and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'd also encourage folks to send me an email and um, I, I can follow up on anything I shared today. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Um, I think my colleague Trent is having some computer and internet problems. So I am gonna jump in here at the last minute and try to take over from him. So let's see how we roll. Uh, Michael, if you wanna stop sharing your slides, we're gonna go right into some Q and A. And we saw in the chat, actually, a lot of people were curious about, you know, doing a poll of who has it. And I think, Nicole, did you set up a poll for us so we can quickly see from our 300 and some people joining us um, who has select all that apply here, an electric vehicle, a hybrid vehicle, or an internal combustion engine in your stockpile of cars at home. So if you want to take just a quick second as our audience and submit your answer and then maybe we'll get our speakers to respond about is this kind of on trend of what they're seeing for Colorado or the state. Looks like Trent is back with us too. Hey Trent. Hey Kristen, thanks. The joys of uh, virtual meeting. <laughs> well that's why we have so many people on the back end here. So I think we've probably got that poll. We can probably go ahead and close it. Um, and then, uh, oh yeah, there's probably a none of the above here of those of you who don't even own a car, which I think similar to how when I lived in DC for a decade, I did not have a car. So let me turn this back to Trent um, and our guests. So thanks. Terrific, thanks, Kristen. Um, Jason, one question that was coming up a lot during the discussion is uh, the need to retrofit our existing infrastructure, especially for something like wireless power transfer versus having to kind of build all new stuff. So maybe you could speak to that a little bit and then uh, Mike, feel free to jump in as well. Yeah, I think that um, I saw a lot of those questions in the chat and you know, I think that we're really looking at optimization of systems, right? So the current model for infrastructure on vehicles is a 300 mile range with high speed fast chargers, right? And so is that really the need? Um, the funny thing is, is, and people can think about this, you can do this self thought experiment is that you know, the only time you, you really don't use 300 mile range very often, the majority of people, right? And so don't get me wrong, I know there's people in our audience who are the exceptions to that, but 25 mile range will get you, I don't know, 77%. And we've got all this data, we've reduced it um, and done this modeling work. And so, you know, the concept with some of the technologies we're investigating is that how do you offload that in, you know, the, the gas tank model, how do you get away from that? And what does that look like? And how, do, you know, what is the infrastructure that's required to support something like that? And then more importantly, is that an optimal solution? Um, there's a lot of challenges with resource availability when you start talking about putting 300 mile range batteries in every single vehicle that's on the road. Um, and so all of these things, like I said, that's why it's an exciting time to be doing research in electrified transportation because it truly is an optimization of systems. And then as soon as you give people free will and the choice to make bad choices, I mean, everything goes crazy. Um, and so that's where we're interested in doing things like agent-based modeling optimization and these things. And so. I hope that answers the question. Um, Mike, one for you. Uh, California has been in the news in the last couple of days for announcing that they're gonna have a total phase out of combustion vehicles in the next couple of years. Uh, what are your general thoughts about that approach and uh, the effectiveness of that kind of a policy lever versus some of the, um, you know, the other things that Colorado is implementing like uh, like credits. Yeah, thanks Trent, that's a great question. And of course, you know, with the news that recently came out, I was anticipating that this would be on folks' minds. So, 
you know, California, because they are such a large market, I think they're, you know, something like the seventh largest economy in the world, if you separate them from the United States. They have the unique ability as a state to influence the auto market just by uh, adjusting their policies and requirements. And the automakers, if they want to sell in California, need to deal with that. So uh, California is not the first political unit to do this. Other uh, countries have, have made these commitments that uh, they will phase out the sale of internal combustion engine vehicles. Colorado, I think, you know, we benefit in the short term from, from California because as that signal is sent to the market, um, you know, those vehicles will be made and not just sold in, in California, but in other states as well. Um, I think that in, in our unique geography, our, the size of our state, um, right now the incentive and infrastructure model makes a lot of sense for us. We want to give people options, but we also have unique challenges in Colorado. So developing an approach that blends kind of the best of that regulatory um, style from California with a, a more Colorado specific balance of incentives um, and regulations is what we're looking to do right now. Absolutely. A uh, couple questions coming through about the doing some life cycle assessments, especially around EV batteries and the, the overall life of the uh, of the batteries, the, the waste produced. Um, any either of you like to, to jump on that one? Sure, I can start real quick. Um, we've got a project funded through the DOE, ARPA-E, uh, looking at Second Life batteries. Can you recondition them for things like grid energy storage? Can you, um, you know, wh what, are, what are the technology options to support that? Um, some really great questions in the chat in terms of what does the life cycle look like in terms of building an all electric vehicle versus running my existing vehicle? And so the one comment that I'll make on that kind of general side of things is that Environmentally, the cheapest part about building a vehicle is building the vehicles. When it burns fuel for 150,000 miles, which is typically the life, and then we can argue over, well, my Toyota's gone a million miles kind of deal, um, is that that's a lot of emissions and that adds up very, very quickly. And so, you know, moving away that huge delta that I illustrated and then Michael really confirmed is that there's a huge delta in greenhouse gas savings as you move to electrified transportation. Yeah, I will just echo what Jason said. You know, that is a that is a problem. It's a problem we recognize, and it's one that a lot of smart people are are out there researching. How do we address this? Um, but uh, it's also important to recognize that internal combustion engines also uh, produce waste, uh, the vehicles themselves. So uh, it's not it's it can be sometimes a bit of a false comparison to act like uh, gasoline vehicles are perfectly recyclable, whereas uh, EVs are not. Um, they both have issues, and I think that we're working to address those problems while we get the air, air quality benefits of EVs in the shorter term. How about uh, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles? Certainly something that has at times seemed to have a lot of promise and a lot, uh, a bright future ahead of it, and maybe you could speak to some of the opportunities and challenges around hydrogen. Sure. Yeah, hydrogen is something that we're always we're always keeping on our radar, and um, in California and in some other countries, there's a pretty robust hydrogen market already. Challenge in Colorado is that we don't have a domestic or an in-state, I should say, production of hydrogen, and so to uh, to get that hydrogen from another state is not yet cost effective. Uh, to produce it in Colorado might be an option in the future. Uh, but it's kind of that classic chicken and egg where the vehicles are not usable without the fuel. The fuel is not yet cost competitive with diesel or even with certain um, with electricity. So uh, as we work to kind of um, break that cycle and get the ball rolling, we might see more of that in the future, especially in the medium and heavy duty space where the weight of batteries can be a really big limiting factor on longer distance and heavier vehicles. If, if we can get cost-effective hydrogen in the state, I think you will see a rapid adoption by transit agencies and trucking fleets, but um, it is a challenge at the moment. Um, so COVID-19 is obviously creating huge impacts all up and down the supply chain in the economy. Uh, any you know, impacts that are being felt in your worlds right now from the effects of COVID or anything that you could forecast in the near term? Well, 
speaking from the transportation side, we, we've had some interesting kind of um, two sides in terms of the, the COVID impact. On the one hand, we saw a lot of really um, stunning photos from around the world of the immediate air quality improvement that resulted from getting a lot of cars off the road. So you photos from Los Angeles, from India, from Colorado. And so in the one sense, it made it much more visible what it is we stand to gain by reducing the pollution of our transportation system. On the other hand, the concerns about health have um, driven a lot of people who have the option, who have the luxury to uh, choose to use transit or not use transit. Many of those folks have opted to start driving more than they would have otherwise because of health concerns. I saw a comment in the chat about why are we prioritizing EVs over transit? The truth is we're prioritizing both. We want fewer, fewer cars on the road. We want more electric cars. We want more electric transit. But we are kind of fighting um, kind of this, the psychological concern about uh, the, the healthiness of being on transit, whether that's founded or not. And so more people are driving. And so it is um, threatening some of the progress that we've made uh, by getting folks to use transit and by electrifying the vehicles that they're using if they do choose to drive. Sure. Jason, anything to add there? I, from the research side, especially from a modeling perspective, it's really easy to model at home. So a lot of the research projects I'm working on have been accelerated because the experimental work can't happen. So they're looking for us to make major advancements. And so it's been a busy time. <laughs> a good kind of busy, I'm sure. Well, we're getting close to wrapping up here and I'm going to give you this one to end on. Uh, what's one thing that you are particularly optimistic about? Anything, anywhere in the EV space, anything from your research, from your, your work, uh, what's one thing that you're looking at that, that you are pretty excited about? Uh, we'll start with Jason and then give Mike the, the final word. Yes, that's a, a great question. Um, I'm excited about the future. I think there's a, a lot of opportunity. I think that um, we're gonna see a lot of change and I think that we've demonstrated it before that we're resilient and we're gonna do great things and that we're gonna go down a great path. And so whether it's wireless power transfer, whether it is, you know, plug-in chart, wh whatever it is, I just think it's a really exciting time with where transportation is going and the quality of life it's going to enable as autonomy comes on board. I look at my grandfather and when his license was taken away, that was a huge hit to his, you know, his uh, standard of living. And I think that I'm, I'm, I'm excited for things like that that are gonna change as we move forward. Yeah, and I, I, I share Jason's excitement about you know, the, the, the potential, the, the new technology, the way that that technology will allow us to rethink some of our assumptions about how we get around and our transportation, our, our relationship to, um, to, our, to our state. And I think the thing that most excites me, honestly, is events like this where members of the public, people that work in this field, there is an excitement by uh, Coloradans, by Americans and by people all over the world for this change. And I think that it's an opportunity to correct a lot of the, um, the negative elements of our transportation system that, that we, we got wrong in the past. This is an opportunity to start fresh. So I'm really looking forward to that. Very well said. Well, thank you both. I want to, I want to, we're very appreciative of uh, your time and expertise. So thank you for uh, being on today and, and sharing with our audience. I hope that uh, everyone had a, had a good time with this session and uh, maybe we'll, uh, we'll have to have you both back for part two sometime in the, in the not too distant future. Um, thank you to our audience today and for tuning in and thank you to all my museum colleagues for helping us put on the show today. Uh, if you like this session, our next one is going to be on October 13th. That's also a Tuesday. And we're going to be talking about grid innovations. So uh, be sure to look for the invitation for that. And again, you can find all the Institute events on our website at institute.dmns.org and on our social channels in the usual places. So uh, thank you again for joining us today and hope to see you next time.